Good afternoon. On behalf of the Library of Congress, we would like to express our deep gratitude to AARP for making this presentation possible. AARP has been a longtime supporter of the library's educational initiatives, and we're very grateful for that. It's now my honor to introduce the co-chairman of the National Book Festival, an indefatigable champion of reading and literacy, David Rubenstein. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. So, we're very honored, uh, very honored to have one of our country's foremost historians and writers, biographers here, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Thank you very much for coming, Doris. Um, how many people here? How many people here have read Team of Rivals? Funny. Okay. How many have read Bully Pulpit? Wow. How many people read our book on Lyndon Johnson? What about uh, the Kennedys and Fitzgeralds? Okay. All right. And how many people here um, agree that she's one of our foremost writers, historians? Okay. So. For, for those who don't know her uh, background, just very briefly, she uh, grew up in uh, New York, Brooklyn, and uh, ultimately um, went to Colby College, got her PhD at Harvard. She was a White House fellow uh, in the Johnson administration, helped President Johnson with his memoirs, uh, and then ultimately went back to teach at Harvard. And for the last uh, number of years, she's been writing uh, extraordinarily uh, well-received and terrific uh, uh, biographies and histories. and. Uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for uh, one of your books as well. So um, you're going to be writing a new book that's coming out September the 18th. It's on leadership. And it's about a book uh, on the leadership skills of four people you've written about. Uh, one is Abraham Lincoln, one is Teddy Roosevelt, uh, one is Franklin Roosevelt, and the other is Lyndon Johnson. So we're going to talk about that today. And uh, I wanted to ask you first, why did you decide to write a book about four different people. You've already written books about them. Why not pick somebody new and write a book about somebody new? Well, what happened is each time I'd finish writing one of the books, um, and I have to take all of that person's books out of my study to make room for the next guy, I felt like I was betraying the person who was there before. It's like having an old boyfriend and moving to a new boyfriend. So I figured, what if I could keep my guys together this time instead of doing that? But I knew I'd have to do it by having a chance to look at them anew in a new way. And I've always been interested in leadership. I mean, once upon a time when I was a graduate student, we, we would stay up late at night discussing questions about leadership. In those days, you're reading Plato and Aristotle, and you're thinking about where does ambition come from, and does the man make the times, or the times make the man? Is our leadership traits born or made? And, and we also talked about boys and girls and what was going on in the world, but those were the kind of things that really interested us. So I decided, what if I look at these guys? And I do call them my guys. It seems maybe a little disrespectful, but I've lived with them for so long each time that I feel familiar to them. What if I just take them and I look at them through the exclusive lens of leadership? And so it became a great project for me. It took five years, not as long as some of the others, but not as short as I thought, because I didn't know as much about them as I thought I should. And I loved every minute of it. It's really been a great, great now, the only uh, one of these presidents that you actually knew, of course, was Lyndon Johnson. And uh, before we get into the book, you might relate how you actually came to know Lyndon Johnson and how you almost lost your job uh, on an article you wrote. True. So when I was chosen as a White House fellow, I was 24 years old. And we had a big dance at the White House. It's a fabulous program, the White House Fellowship. Colin Powell was a White House fellow, Wesley Clark, Senator Tim Worth. We had a big dance at the White House the night we were selected. He did dance with me that night. Not that peculiar. There were only three women out of the 16 White House fellows. But as he twirled me around the floor, he whispered that he wanted me to be assigned directly to him in the White House. But it was not to be that simple. For in the months leading up to my selection, like many young people, while I was a graduate student at Harvard, I'd been active in the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I'd written an article against LBJ, which we'd sent into the New Republic. Hadn't heard anything, but it suddenly came out two days after the dance in the White House. <laughs> And the title of the article was How to Remove Lyndon Johnson from Power. <laughs> so I was certain he would kick me out of the program. But instead, surprisingly, he said, oh, bring her down here for a year. And if I can't win her over, no one can. So I did eventually end up working for him in the White House and then accompanying him to his ranch those last years to help him on his memoirs. And I must say, it was the most extraordinary experience. He's the most formidable, interesting, strange, brilliant, um, colorful character I've ever met, and what a privilege it was to have spent so many hours 
with his aging line of a man. I, I'd like to think that the empathy that I began to feel for him, despite not changing my mind about the war in Vietnam, is what I hoped I carried over when I went to each president after him, and probably might not have been a presidential historian had it not been for Lyndon Johnson. Okay. So let's talk about each of these presidents, and we'll do it in this way. Uh, what you've done in your book is you have each of these four presidents, and you've uh, to make it simple, there are three parts to each description of the book, of, of, the, of the presidents. One is how they were educated and grew up and whether they were kind of destined for greatness or not, what people thought they might be. Second, what was the, uh, the problem in their life that depressed them, maybe thought they were not going anywhere in life and they were even suicidal at points. And third, what challenge they met as president that showed that they had great leadership skills. So let's go through Lincoln first. Lincoln grew up uh, not in a wealthy family. Uh, did his father try to educate him? What was, the, what was it like growing up as the son of Mr. Lincoln? Uh, the circumstances that Lincoln grew up in took enormous perseverance and determination to overcome. Um, he, there was a subscription schools in Illinois then, so the only way he could go to school was to pay a certain amount. So he never went to past the age of nine or 10 in school because the family not only couldn't afford it, but the father thought it was a waste of time for somebody to educate themselves when he should be working in the fields. So it meant that Lincoln had to scour the countryside for books and get everything he could lay his hands on. At one point, he walked like 16 miles to get a certain book that he wanted to have. And in a certain sense, somehow, books became much more important to him as a result of that. It was said when he got a copy of the King James Bible or Aesop's Fable or one of Shakespeare's plays, he was so excited. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. And there was a sense in which books carried him to places that he could never go. Through books, he began to develop an alternative thought for what he might be in life. He was really smart. In those few years when he was in school, he was without peer, and I think that's where some of his confidence came from. After a while, he was teaching the other kids in his class rather than the teacher because he had learned so much. But in a certain sense, once he started reading about other people in other places, he began to think, maybe I can have another life other than shucking corn or splitting rails. And he had to get away from the father who, when he would see him reading, would destroy his books. So he finally left the home. when You, you had, couldn't leave until you were 21 in those days. And he finally left and went to New Salem. And that's where his political career began. He ran for office after being there only six months. And he writes this amazing, amazing um, handbill that he gives out to the people explaining why he's running. And he said, every man, he's 23 years old, every man has his peculiar ambition Mine is to be truly esteemed of by my fellow man, to do something worthy to get their esteem, to think that way when you're 23. And then he said, uh, young and unknown to many of you, and um, I've, I, if, I, if you don't put me in office, I won't be disappointed that much because I've had so much disappointment in my life. But if you do, I promise I will do everything to pay you back. And then he said, and, and if I don't win this time, I'm going to try five or six more times until it's too embarrassing and too, too, too humiliating, and then I'll never try again. Well, he didn't win the first time, but it didn't dampen his ambition. The second time he tries, he'd met more people. They had seen the kind of person he was, the kindness, the humility, the storytelling ability, the patience, and he wins that next election, and that's the beginning of this extraordinary political career. So but you point out that he wasn't educated in this traditional sense of going to school and law school, graduate school. Um, is there a reason to think that maybe not going to these schools enables you to be a great writer? He wrote the Gettysburg Address uh, without having been educated. What was the, the secret behind his ability with words and to be able to write so eloquently? Well, he probably had a gift for the rhythm of language. I think maybe you're born with that. But more importantly, maybe, he read great books. I mean, he, he was not spending his time reading a lot of horizontal books. He's just reading things like the Bible, great poetry, and Shakespeare. And he dives so deeply into them. And he said whenever he read something that he really loved, he wanted to read it aloud. And then he would take, he would take his, his, his knife, if he was on a, on a plank where he was working on a rail, and he would write out the words on a rail. And then he'd transfer them to paper. And then he'd finally memorize them. And they'd become part of him. So it's almost like vertical learning for him was deeper than all those of us who read all these wide things and can hardly remember them. He read the best. Okay, so he ran for office. And he ultimately got elected to state legislature. And ultimately sent, served two years in Congress as a member of the Whig Party. Uh, and he was a competent lawyer, but there were a lot of competent lawyers, lots of people work in Congress. Was there anybody who said, um, this man is destined for greatness? Was there anybody who said that? Well, you know, it's interesting. 
Theodore Roosevelt once wrote something about the importance of a crisis making a leader great. And he said, if Lincoln had not had a war, if there'd been no war, no one would have known his name. But he's wrong, because all the people who'd seen him from the time he was young, even if, they had, if he'd never become president, they knew they were in the presence of somebody special. They saw how much he was trying to learn. They wanted to help him on his upward climb. They would lend him books. Um, the, the guy who was the village cooper would keep his fire on late at night so that Lincoln could read, because that was the one place where there'd be light. They watched him help widows. They watched him help people who needed something done for them. They saw his sense of humor. Even as a young kid, he learned how to tell stories. He used to listen to his father entertain people who came by the street and tell stories. The father had the one thing that he valued, which was being a great storyteller. And Lincoln became this fabulous storyteller. And he had a sense of humor that matched his melancholy, because there was a sadness about him when he was young, because he had these huge ambitions. And he thought, I'll never reach those goals. But the way he whistled off sadness was through his humor. They saw all these traits, and they knew he was special. Whether they knew he would ever become president, I doubt that they could have thought that big. But they knew that there was okay. something about this guy. Let's talk about Teddy Roosevelt. He did not grow up in a poor setting. His oh, father okay. was a very wealthy person. Uh, but did that mean he was going to be necessarily uh, a very uh, smart person, or did it mean he was going to be a very good athlete? What was it like growing up in Teddy Roosevelt? Well, the, the most important thing for Teddy Roosevelt growing up was that he suffered from an almost life-threatening asthma when he was a child, which meant that he couldn't participate in physical activities, but it meant that he developed his mind. He read books, too, like Lincoln did in every spare moment he could find. Unlike Lincoln, however, all he needed to do was pull a book off his vast library shelf, or if he told his father, who he loved and who had a fabulous relationship with, that he wanted a certain book, it would suddenly magically appear. In fact, there's one time when he wrote in a letter that he had written, he had read 50 novels that summer on a vacation. And then the father took him on trips around the world. He would teach him. He, father was like a tutor for him. And eventually, that, that sense of reading became a huge part of him. He said that um, books were the greatest companions, that a leader needs to know about human nature more than anything in the world. And the best way to learn about human nature is through books. But for him, too, Books created an alternative future because here's this little kid who wants to be a fearless person and he's very timid and he's, and he's got this asthma. So he reads about explorers in Africa. He reads about soldiers. He reads about deer slayers. And he begins to imagine himself one of those. And later he becomes this courageous guy, this strenuous guy, because what at a certain point his father says to him, Teddy, you've got the mind but not the body. And without the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must do something to make your body. So the little kid says, I'll make my body. And he goes into all these strenuous exercises. And he becomes a champion and a very strong person by the time he gets to be past Harvard and into, into the presidency. Okay, so he goes to Harvard. And is he well respected there? Well, well, he's rather an odd duck at Harvard because he really wants to be an ornithologist, and he collects dead snakes and dead birds, and they're all in his room. And, and when he first comes, he's kind of a prig in a way. He doesn't want to make friends with anybody who is not on the social register because he wants them to be part of his same class. And he's also different from the other kids. He speaks up in class. He interrupts the professors. And those were the times when you just sort of were a C student, and that's what you're supposed to be. And he worked hard, and he did very well. But the interesting thing is that once he gets out of Harvard, he ends up, at the age of 23, running for the state legislature because, again, somebody comes to him and says, you know, maybe you'd be a good candidate because your father had been well known. He was a philanthropist, his father. And once he starts going around meeting people from the working class, meeting people that were in the other part of the district, he's in the silk stocking district, but there's also tenements in that district, he began to feel at ease with them. He was easily able to talk to them, and he lost that kind of sense of privilege that he had before, and he became a natural politician. All right, so he is in the state legislature, but he's kind of full of himself a bit, doesn't make as many friends as he might want. Uh, did anybody say, this man is very smart, he's a good athlete, and he's going to be president of the United States? Well, what happens to him is you're absolutely right. When he was first in the state legislature, he developed what he himself admitted was a swelled head. 
He used to, he had a great way of language, so he could make headlines and everything. He would pound his desk when he was mad at somebody. He would say these outrageous things. And he became well known in New York, but after a while, he couldn't get anything done in the state legislature because he had burned so many bridges. So he finally realized this is where humility came in, an important quality in all my guys. When they finally develop humility, which means the ability to recognize your limitations, to acknowledge your mistakes, he realized that he couldn't fix it alone. Well, he didn't quite say it that way. He said, I, I can't do it alone. I need cooperation of other people. And then he became a more mature politician. People knew, again, that he was special. Whether they could predict at that point that he would be a president, I don't know. But they, they knew they were in the, in the presence of somebody with charisma, somebody with energy, somebody with quite a lot of brilliance. So um, his, he's related to FDR how? How is he related to Well, he's like the sixth cousin to FDR. But more importantly, um, Teddy Roosevelt's brother, Elliot Roosevelt, um, was the father of Eleanor Roosevelt. So that's what the real okay, connection right. is. So Eleanor's uncle is Teddy. And her father, Elliot, Teddy's younger brother, was, had an epilepsy as a child, became an alcoholic, and died young. So Teddy Roosevelt really became like a father to Eleanor. Right. So, and Franklin loved Teddy Roosevelt. So the, all three of them become this wonderful right. circle. Now, FDR grows up in a very wealthy setting as well. He's the uh, only child of his uh, father's marriage with his mother. Uh, but it's a bucolic setting in, in, uh, up in Hyde Park. But was there anybody who thought this man is going to be president of the United States? Certainly not FDR. But the interesting thing about both FDR and Teddy Roosevelt is they were the center of their parents' love, which gave them a certain confidence. I mean, with Teddy Roosevelt, not only was he a center of his father's love and his mother's love, but the other siblings made him the center of their lives because he used to tell them stories. After he read books, he would tell them stories, and they would sit around, and he would organize their games. And so, too, FDR was the center of his parents' life. In fact, Teddy so wanted to be the center of everybody's life after having experienced that as a child that his daughter Alice once said he wanted to be the baby at the baptism, the bride at the wedding, and the corpse at the funeral. <laughs> so, so FDR had that same sense, I think, of being adored as a child. But he, and he had any book that he wanted to, this magnificent library that he could have. But when he was young, he learned in a different way. He liked to read aloud. He liked to listen to his mother read. There's a story one time when his mother's reading to him, and he's playing with his stamp collection. He loved stamps. He loved maps. He loved collecting things. I think it was his way of having an independence from the smothering of the parents who loved him so much. And his mother said, oh, you're not listening to me. I'm not going to finish reading the book. And then he recited back the whole passages of what he right. said. He said, I'd be ashamed of myself if I couldn't do two things at the same time. But because he was not a regular student, I mean, he became a C student at Groton, at Harvard, at Columbia, people thought he really wasn't as smart as he turned out to be. In fact, that famous quote where Oliver Wendell Holmes meets him much later and says he has a first-rate temperament but a second-rate intellect, he was right about the first grade temperament, that being born with that optimistic temperament, which got him through everything he had to get through later in life, was probably the greatest gift that he was endowed with. But he was much smarter than people knew. He had a problem-solving intellect. For example, when he studied the stamps, he would want to know. He's a little kid now. He wants to know where the country that issued the stamp came from. So he'd look in the encyclopedia. He'd read everything about the country. And then he would finally figure out um, if he didn't know the words. He, would, he said to his mother, I'm halfway through Webster's Dictionary. He studied maps. He studied atlases. And he wanted to know all about the terrain. And he'd read about mountains and the environment. And all of that became so important when this man had to lead us through World War II. And when he becomes a, much a, a leader later on, he has a brain trust. He can bring information out from the other people by listening to them. So the idea that he wasn't smart because he didn't do well in school is something we make a terrible mistake about. Now, Lyndon Johnson uh, is sort of in between all of them. He is not poor, but he's not rich. He's not a book learner, but he's pretty smart. So how do you describe his background and, and, and his father's relationship with him? Well, the most interesting thing at the beginning is that what I learned, which I hadn't known all that much before, is that when he was two years old, he learned the alphabet. When he was four years old, he learned to read. And he could recite long passages of Tennyson and Longfellow because his mother wanted him to be that kind of a kid. The mother had been college educated. She wanted to be a writer. She was a journalist. She had met her husband, a state legislator, when she interviewed him. And so this mother really, he said when he would recite these passages, he told me, she would hug him so much, she was so proud of him that he felt like he was going to be smothered to death. 
In fact, there's a funny story relating to the mother, which is that when I was working with Lyndon Johnson, um, everything was going great. You know, I knew he had a womanizing reputation, but I was constantly talking to him about steady boyfriends, even when I had no boyfriends at all. And so, you know, everything was going great until one day he wanted to, wanted to discuss our relationship, which sounded ominous when he took me nearby to the lake, conveniently called Lake Lyndon Johnson. And he had wine and cheese and a red check table, all the romantic trappings. And he started out, Doris, more than any other woman I have ever known, and my heart sank. And then he said, you remind me of my mother. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty embarrassing given what was going on in my mind. But I guess somehow I was at Harvard, I was an intellectual, and here was this mother. But the interesting thing is that even though he had those talents when he was young, all he really wanted was to be following his father. Um, and after a while, he only wanted to read books. He said, is it real? Is it about somebody in history? He didn't want to read fiction. He didn't want to expand that mind. He wanted to go with the father on the campaign trail. He wanted to go with him to the state legislator, legislature. And politics became his love. And the father and the mother never got along very well. So choosing one over the other was more complicated. But the sad thing is, because he never did well in school, because he was too restless to sit, even though he had that extraordinary mind, um, he, he always felt like somehow he would never be appreciated by the Harvards. His father said to him, if you brush up against the grindstone of life, you'll have more polish than any of those Harvard and Yale people ever did. And he said, I wanted to believe him, but I never could. And even when I was first starting to work for him, and he wanted me to work full time for him, and I told him I couldn't, I was going back to Harvard, I was going to start teaching. And so he said, all or nothing, we can either come all or nothing. And so I, I thought I wasn't going to go. The last day of his presidency, he called me in and he said, all right, part time. And then he said, you know, it's not so easy to get people to work for you when you're no longer at the height of your power. I won't forget what you're doing for me. And then he said, now, go, I know you're going back to Harvard. You'll be coming on vacations. Don't let those Harvards get to you. Don't let them make you hate me. So always that feeling toward that larger world that he easily could have been a part. He was as smart as McNamara, as smart as Bundy, any of those guys. So as a young man, though, did people think that somebody whose father was a state legislator, he's not a wealthy person, not particularly well-educated, that he would be president of the United States? Is that anybody's uh, dream that for Lyndon Johnson? Well, yes. This is what's interesting. So once he gets into politics, he's an absolute natural. And he, as a young, and, and when he was young, he was a real New Deal congressman. He wanted to do for people what would help people. And he meets FDR for the first time when FDR is president. And he's, he's a real, I was about to say something that I know I can't say on television. Anyway, he was, um, he, he was a natural um, storyteller. He could make up things, for example. Let us say it that way. <laughs> So you can guess what that word might have been. So he knows that FDR is going fishing. He knows nothing about fishing. And he starts talking about how much he loves fishing. Anyway, they get along terrifically. And FDR tells somebody, I've just met this amazing young congressman. Do you know, he's the kind of uninhibited pro I would have been if I hadn't gone to Harvard. I think someday he may be the first Southern president of the United States. Right. OK. So let's talk about the depression crises that each of these men experienced relatively early or in their career and their lives. So Abraham Lincoln uh, gets to the point where he's almost suicidal. They're, they're so afraid he might commit suicide, they take away the, the, the razor blades and so forth. What were the things that caused this enormous depression? Well, what happened to Lincoln is that he broke his word to his constituents, and he broke his word to Mary when he asked her to undo their engagement. And for him, his word meant everything. He had promised his constituents that he would bring infrastructure projects into their area so that they could get their goods to market, dredging the harbors and making the roads. And then a huge recession hit the state, and they had to stop the projects in halfway. And the state went into bankruptcy and debt, and he was blamed. He took responsibility for it, and he said he was going to leave the state legislature. At that same time, he broke his engagement with Mary, not sure he could support a wife, but also not sure, as he said, that his heart was going with his hand. But he knew what it meant to her to be humiliated. And the fact that he had hurt these people, that he had hurt his constituents, was so painful to him that he went into this suicidal depression. And he stayed in his room for weeks on time. And the friends came and, as you say, took all knives and razors and scissors from his room. And his best friend, Joshua Speed, came to his side. And he said, Lincoln, you must rally or you will die. He said, I know that. And I would just as soon die right now, but I've not yet accomplished anything to make any human being remember that I have lived. 
So fueled by that worthy ambition, always from the beginning he had this double ambition, not just for himself, but for doing something larger than that. He returned to finish out that final term in the state legislature, and as you said, eventually won a seat in Congress. And then he loses twice for the Senate, um, and yet instead of it again undoing his ambition, he said, we've made a mark on the, endur the enduring problem of the age, slavery, because of his debates with Stephen Douglas. And then he's still losing twice, is willing to try as a dark horse candidate for the presidency, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> so with Mary Todd Lincoln, he was engaged to her, and then he broke up the relationship, and why did he decide to go back? And, and you might talk about his earlier girlfriend who, who died. Right, I mean, the, the hardest thing for Lincoln was the death really surrounded him. I mean, his mother died when he was only nine years old. His only sister, Sarah, died in childbirth a few years later. And his first love, Ann Rutledge, died at the age of 22. And the hard thing was that when his mother died, she didn't say to him, we'll meet in another world. She simply said to him, Abraham, I'm going away from you now, and I shall never return. And that's when he began to be obsessed with what happens to us after we die, and when he began to think that if I can only accomplish something, maybe somebody will remember me after I die, and they'll still be telling the story of me. I will still live on. It was true, I think, people have studied this more and more even than me, that he did love Ann Rutledge, who died suddenly from one of those things that comes through. And when he first met Mary, I think he really did care greatly for her. She, she loved poetry, she loved drama, she came from a very educated, wealthy family, and, and she was one of the few people at the time who loved politics in that world. She'd come to live with her sister in Springfield, and her sister was married to the then governor of the state. And when he first asked her to dance, she later remembered, she said, he said, Mary, I want to dance with you in the worst way. And after they finished the dance, she said, he certainly did. <laughs> but, and uh, by and, the way, uh, by coincidence, who was the other suitor to marry Mary Todd Lincoln? Stephen Douglas. That's what's so amazing. <laughs> there, it's a very small circle of these politicians. But she was dating somebody who was six foot four and somebody who was four right. foot six. Right. right. Okay. So she'd have to stretch or go back down, right? So, um, okay, let's talk about Teddy Roosevelt. He has an experience in life that nobody wants to go through on one day that really put a him into a depression. You might describe what happened. Yeah, I mean, he's in the state legislature and his wife, Alice, who he dearly loved, he'd fallen in love with her when she was in, at Harvard, and um, she was a beautiful young woman, was having their first child, and he got a telegram saying, Alice's child is born. And they have cigars, they're all celebrating, and then an hour later he gets another telegram saying, um, you must come home immediately. Um, your mother is dying, and Alice is dying too. The mother had come to take care of Alice. She was only 49 years old, and she got typhoid fever, and she was dying. And then he goes back home immediately. His brother Elliot meets him at the door and says, there's a curse on this house. He goes inside. His mother is dying. He holds her in his arms. She dies at 3 a.m. 12 hours later, Alice died in childbirth. They said that he walked around in a dazed, stunned state. He couldn't stay in the state legislature anymore. He had to get away. So he had gotten a ranch previously just to think he might go every now and then out west in the Badlands. And he went for two years, and he became essentially a cowboy, a rancher in the Badlands. He said as long as he could ride his horse 15 hours a day, physical activity prevented overthought, and he was finally able to sleep at night. But later, he said, this was the best educational asset that he could possibly have developed because he developed this love of the land, of open spaces, that was permanently associated with his name through the conservation measures. Now, the daughter who was born then, his first daughter, um, named Alice. Right. Um, why would he not really mention her name ever? Why did he kind of ignore her? He had his sister, I guess, raising her. What, what was the name, nature yeah. of that relationship? Yeah, he had a very peculiar attitude toward death, which was that once, once his wife, Alice, died, he couldn't bear to even say the name of the little girl who they called Alice. So he only called her baby. And he didn't even want to bring her up somehow because she reminded him too much of the woman who had died. So he did give her to his sister to bring up. But then what happened is he had once been very friendly with a young woman named Edith whom he'd grown up with and who was in love with him from the time she was young until he lost her by going to Alice. And eventually when he started to get healthy again in the Badlands, he started corresponding with Edith. And in the end, he had a marriage with her that was as good a lifelong love of marriage that he could possibly add, and he had a whole bunch of kids. But somehow, when something hurt him in the past, unlike Lincoln, who would talk endlessly about the people who were in the past, 
and who wanted to remember them because he thought that's the way you bring them back to life. He thought if something's gone, you just exercise it from your mind. It wasn't a healthy right. part of him in my judgment. So when his wife and mother died in the same day, he later wrote a letter, a very famous letter, saying the light had gone out of his life. Right. And he essentially felt his life was over, right? Right. And um, the idea that he would ever become president of the United States at that time certainly didn't exist in anybody's mind, right? The most interesting thing that happened to him, I think that's right, is before this all happened to him, he looked at his life, as many people do when they're ambitious, as a series of rungs that he would like to go up. Okay, I'm in the state legislature now. I'd like to get in the state senate. You know, and then I think I'd like to go to Congress, and then I could be a senator. He was ambitious, and then who knows what might happen after that. But once this fatalistic thing happened to him, he decided that you can't plan your life that way anymore. So I'm just going to take whatever job looks good to me at the time, where I can broaden my horizons, where I can want to do it, a worthy job. So he comes back to New York, and he becomes a civil service commissioner in Washington, a job that his friends think, that's way below you. You have huge talents. But he wanted to make the merit system work. And then he becomes police commissioner of New York. And they say, why in the world are you doing that? And it turned out to be an extraordinary experience for him. He goes into tenements that he had never seen before. He's walking the streets at night. He, he made himself, when he was in the police department, he would disguise himself so he could go and walk on the beat between midnight and 4 AM and just to see if the policemen were on the beat. And they didn't recognize him until finally he would say, I'm the police commissioner. Why aren't you on your beat? And after a while, these cartoonists had pictures of these big teeth of Teddy's and those funny spectacles, and policemen terrified at the thought they might encounter him. But those experiences, and then he becomes a soldier in the Spanish-American War, and then he becomes a governor, and then he becomes vice president, and then he becomes president. He had the broadest experience, and he was the youngest president. And he said that he learned fellow feeling or, or self, you know, he was no, so, not self-conscious anymore going into places that he of his privileged background might never go. It's one of the things that saddened me about the last 2016 election, that political experience was considered a handicap. In his case, it broadened him. It made him learn other ways of life than he is from his background would never have known. Now, for Lincoln and for uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the depressions, the problems they had in life were somewhat psychological. Um, Franklin Roosevelt has a physical problem. What is that physical problem, and how did that come about? Well, he's, he's up at Campobello, and he doesn't feel well one morning, but he goes out and exercises all day, and he comes home so tired that he can't even take off his bathing suit, and he goes to bed, and within 48 hours, he was paralyzed from the waist down, having gotten polio. And years of striving would follow him from that. And it, it changed his life, there's no question. I mean, he, when he was in a wheelchair, and the early days, and they told him that the only chance he really had was to strengthen his upper body. So he would ask to be taken out of the wheelchair and put on the library floor so he could crawl around the floor so that his back would get stronger. And then he decided to crawl up the stairs, and he would hoist himself up the stairs, one rung at a time, holding on to the banisters, sweat pouring down his face. And Eleanor said the extraordinary thing was when he made it to the top, they would celebrate as if a mountain had been climbed. And she realized that when each one of these small wins was celebrated, he began to get his joy in life back again, because there had been a terrible depression when he thought not only that he would be paralyzed for the rest of his life, but he thought that his own ambitions in politics would be undone. Because at that point, he'd not only been in the state, state Senate, he'd been Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he'd been a vice presidential candidate in 1920 before he got polio. So he was definitely thinking he was going somewhere. The polio changed that possibility, or so it seemed. But then amazingly, in 1924, Al Smith was running for the presidency, and they asked if Franklin Roosevelt, he hadn't really been in public since the polio, would give the nominating speech. And he knew he would have to somehow traverse um, from there to the podium. And the only way he could appear to be walking, he couldn't walk on his own power, was if he had braces locked in place and he could lean on somebody's arm, he could appear to be walking. So he practiced for weeks at home, measuring the steps that he could do, leaning on his son Jimmy's arm. When he finally got to the podium that night, the sweat again is pouring down his face, but he delivers this incredible happy warrior speech. And he comes home that night, and he said to his family, we made it, we made it. And then, much more importantly, he's still not ready to go into public life. He still thinks he cannot be a politician. He can't be a president unless he learns how to walk. But he goes to Warm Springs because he hears that's a place where the hot waters can help you. 
And once he gets there, something much larger happens. He develops it into a rehab center, first real rehab center. And it's not simply to help his fellow polios learn how to use the water to help their muscles, but he wants them to have fun in life again. He wants them to enjoy things. So he arranges dances with the wheelchairs. He arranges poker games, soccer games, and things in the pool. And he learns what it's like to make other people feel better. And as Francis Perkins, his labor secretary, said, he emerged different from that whole experience, completely warm-hearted, with an understanding of other people to whom fate had also dealt an unkind hand. He became a leader, a much deeper leader than he had been before. Now, it wasn't a secret to most people in the political world that he'd had polio, um, but most people in the, in the United States probably didn't know it or it wasn't as well advertised. But why was it that the press was willing to go along with the idea of never photographing him in his wheelchair? Yeah, it's an extraordinary thing. Even though people understood that he had polio, they didn't understand that he was a paraplegic. They didn't know that. And everybody around had made a code of honor on the part of the press that they'd never photograph him, they'd never show him with his braces on. The most amazing moment is in 1936 when he came to give the um, acceptance speech. He was being helped to walk down the aisle. He reached over to shake the hands of somebody, and he fell. His braces unlocked. His speech sprawled all over the floor. And he finally said to the Secret Service, get me together again. They put his braces on. They get him up on the podium. And he delivers the great rendezvous with destiny speech. But most importantly, not a word was said in the press the next day that he'd fallen. They simply gave the words of the speech. When I think about where we've come since then, when President Bush is sick in Japan, when President Ford falls down a plane step, we can't wait to find them in those embarrassing situations. There was a code of honor, as I said. If that new photographer came along, not knowing it, and tried to take a picture of him, an older one would knock the camera out of the ground. It was a dignity to the presidency. I mean, you wished that he didn't feel he had to do that. You would hope nowadays that he could be a paraplegic and still be the Franklin Roosevelt that he was. But he made the decision then that that was not possible. And if he said that, and his political instincts are better than mine looking back, then I believe him. But there was a sense that there was a way of treating people with dignity in the way the press handled politicians that I wish we could restore today. So now, Lyndon Johnson's setback or depression is something that only Lyndon Johnson would think was quite comparable to the other ones. He lost an election. But can you describe <laughs> why that would be such a terrible thing? It does seem crazy, right? I mean, 1941, he loses a Senate election that he should have won at the last minute he lost. And it did catapult him into it, such a depression, because for him, losing an election was a repudiation of his deepest self. I mean, that's what he was. He was a politician. I mean, he loved his wife. He loved his children. But politics had to fill this big hole in him that was too hard to fill without politics being there. And what happened is he went into a, a decline, really. Sometimes these kind of adversities can send you backwards rather than forwards. And in his self, he's, he decided that he would pursue wealth instead of just working as he always had in politics. He turned his back on the New Deal. He realized if he ever were going to win another chance at a Senate seat, Texas was becoming increasingly conservative so that he would have to become conservative as well. And when he wins finally in 1948 and gets into the Senate, then he pursues power and he becomes incredibly powerful. I mean, he knows how to do it. He becomes majority leader. But then the incredible thing is he has a second big adversity. Just six months after he became majority leader, he had a nearly fatal heart attack. And when he was in the hospital and he began to say to himself, he, the proximity of death was right there, you know, if I died now, what would I be remembered for? I mean, all of these people, it's so interesting, they think about that. It's something larger than what maybe ordinary people think about. And then he comes back to the Senate and he becomes once again the progressive person he had once been. And he gets the first civil rights bill through the Senate, even though it's not a strong bill, it's the opening of door to civil rights. And then, of course, when he gets into the presidency, oh. that becomes the thing he wants to do, oh. to do something that he'll be remembered for, and it becomes civil rights. In that election, one of the things that depressed him was that he could have won the election. He was maybe exposed to win, but he thought the election was stolen from him. And did he resolve never to let that happen again? And how was it stolen? <laughs> well, what happened is in those days, in 1941 and then again in 1948, People knew that there were certain counties where you could put as many votes in as you wanted to. I mean, they could just make people go and add up extra votes. So if they were your counties, you usually would wait to say how many votes you had in them and to know how many you needed when you knew how close you were to the other guy. But he was so sure he had won in 1941, he wanted to make it happen earlier. So he announced that he had X number of votes from one of his counties. And then he was carried around on the arms of his people 
Well, the other guy had his county still. He could then put more votes in his county than LBJ had in his, so he happens to win. So in 48, he reversed the process. <laughs> so um, let's go through the leadership examples you go through in your book. You could have cited many, but let's talk about, um, in, in uh, the case of Abraham Lincoln, um, obviously a great leader, but you cite uh, principally the Emancipation Proclamation. Why do you think that is an example of great leadership? Well, if I may just say something first, which is that in dealing with them as leaders, I realized that all of them lived in turbulent times, and that, thus the title of the book, Leadership in Turbulent Times. I mean, think about it. Um, it's become a little bit more relevant now <laughs> than it was when I thought about it five years ago, but each one of them faced an extraordinary situation, and in Lincoln's case, of course, he comes into office and the, um, the Civil War is about to begin. Um, the country is on fire. Um, it's divided into two. And he says if he'd ever known the, the, the terror of what he would face, he wasn't thought he could live through it. But the big question he has to face is that when the war starts, it's predominantly being fought to preserve the Union, to bring the South and the North back together again. He had always hated slavery, and there were some people who were hoping, even at the beginning of his presidency, that he would do something about liberating the slaves at the same time as preserving the Union. But he was stuck by the idea that the Constitution protected slavery in those states that wanted to keep slavery. And so he, and he, and he knew that most of the Union Army was fighting simply to preserve the Union, not to emancipate the slaves. But as the war went on, and as the North was doing so badly, in the Peninsula Campaign in the summer of 1862, he went to visit the soldiers, which he always did in the middle of any battle. He knew he wanted to walk amidst the thinning ranks of the soldiers, to, um, you know, to visit the wounded in the hospital, and to get a sense of the situation. And while he was there, he began to realize more and more that the slaves were helping the Confederates in an enormous way. They're serving as teamsters. They're serving as cooks. They're, um, they're tending the plantations so that the soldiers can be liberated to come to the, to the battlefield. And he realized that he had powers as the commander in chief, that if something were a military necessity, he could use those powers. He went to the soldiers' home that summer and he was able to think this all through. So he came to his cabinet and he said, I'm going to issue an emancipation proclamation as commander in chief. The, the South is benefiting from the slaves. If we take that benefit away, it'll help the North, so it's military necessity. He finally convinces his cabinet, even though some didn't agree with him, they thought it would make the midterm elections lose, it would make the war go on even longer than it would. But somehow he had so created a sense of trust in him that they didn't make their disagreements public. And then he had to convince the army, who at the first were upset about the idea of this, but so trusting had the army become in him because he'd visited them so many times that they went along with it. And so finally, in January of 1863, he actually makes the Emancipation Proclamation real. And the question some people thought is, would he go back on his word? Because there was a lot of outcry about it, even at that point. But when he went to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, his own hand was numb and shaking. Because that morning, there'd been a huge New Year's reception. And at that New Year's reception, he had shaken a 1,000 hands. So when he went to sign the proclamation, his own hand was numb and shaking. He put the pen down. He said, if ever my soul were in an act, it is in this act. But if I sign with a shaking hand, posterity will say he hesitated. So he waited and waited until he could sign with an unusually bold hand. And then the amazing thing is that Joshua Speed, his old friend, came to the White House soon after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. And they both remembered that terrible moment when he was in that near suicidal depression. And when he said that I would as soon die now, but I've not yet done anything to make any human being remember that I've lived, and he said to Joshua, I hope in this Emancipation Proclamation that my fondest hopes will be realized, that this will be something that will be remembered, and so it surely has been. So in, in the movie Lincoln, which is made uh, after the book of Team of Rivals, uh, it's all about, although you wrote about 500 pages or so in the book, it's only about three or four pages in the book is in the movie. Um, that's a whole separate story, but it's about the 13th Amendment. Why did we need the 13th Amendment after we had the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, just to mention about the movie, the thing that was so wonderful about the movie was that even though they wisely chose a smaller subject, the 13th Amendment, rather than the whole horizontal atmosphere of the war, it still gave everything that I cared about, that most importantly that Lincoln would have cared about, about his character, his humor, 
his melancholy, his storytelling ability, his moral convictions, his political genius. And that was the important thing to show. And also Spielberg wanted Daniel Day-Lewis to play Lincoln from the very beginning. And he, he had not said yes to these more horizontal scripts. When he finally said yes, he knew that he had gotten his man. But the reason the 13th Amendment was so important was that Lincoln worried that once the war came to an end, that then military necessity would no longer be a valuable, a viable, viable way to have undone the Constitution. So he wanted a permanent constitutional amendment that would end slavery forever. Let's talk now about uh, Teddy Roosevelt. There are many examples of leadership that he gave. You, fo you focus on uh, the coal strike. What was the big deal about the coal strike? So what happens is that this is the pivotal moment in Teddy's presidency. I tried to choose moments that were pivotal in each one of their presidencies instead of doing the whole presidency, partly because I knew that I didn't want the book to be as fat as some of these other books were. When, when a woman was reading The Bully Pulpit, she told me she was reading it at home at night and she was reading it in hardback and she fell asleep and it broke her nose. <laughs> so, so I figured I'm gonna try and make this book on leadership not as fat. So if I went through their whole presidencies, it would be fatter and fatter and fatter. So I chose these pivotal moments. So in Ketty's case, the pivotal moment was there was a strike, a six month strike between the miners and the coal barons. And in New England, coal was the only way you got fuel. So as winter and fall were coming, Hospitals were closing down, schools were closing. It could have been a national emergency, and certainly a New England emergency. But the problem for Teddy Roosevelt was that the president had no precedent to intervene in a labor management strike. Everything was considered private then. The government had no business being involved in these things. So he had to begin to see the idea that there were three parties to this strike. There's labor, there's management, and there's the public. And he represents the public. So he started to go around and he'd love to go around on a train to, to talk to people and create public sentiment to tell people that perhaps the president did have some power to get involved in this because the public was involved. And these train trips that he took were such an important way of creating public sentiment. He loved to go sometimes six weeks in the spring and six weeks in the fall, and he would stop at little stations along the way, and then he would continue to go and wave to people who would just be standing on the tracks in these small places before when the train wasn't stopping. There's a great story that he's waving frantically at a group of people, and they're not responding rather coldly until he's told because of his nearsightedness that he's waving frantically at a herd of cows. Little wonder that they weren't responding. So anyway, he starts telling people that I think a president has a steward or stewardship role to, to this office. And he decides finally to invite both sides to the White House. Never had labor management come to the White House before. This is so different from what we imagine now. So they come and they have this really unproductive meeting because the coal barons won't even talk to the miners. They say, we're not talking to these guys. They're outlaws. We can't even have a conversation with them. And so the lucky thing Teddy does, though, he had had a stenographer at the beginning take notes. And he asked them if he could do that. So, and the minor guys happened to be very open. They actually suggested arbitration. They said, we'll do, if you put into arbitration, whatever you decide, we'll go with you. And the, the coal baron said, we're not even listening to these guys, they're outlaws. So he publishes the whole meeting. And it sounds terrible on the part of the miners. So they, I mean, on the part of the coal owners. So they finally decide that they will go to arbitration. But they won't go if Teddy suggests it. They won't go if the miners suggest it. So Teddy gets J.P. Morgan to go and suggest it. And then that saves face for them. They get together. They settle it. It's settled on the batter of both sides. And it really was the symbol of his square deal, which was the program that, that really symbolized his entire presidency. Square deal for the rich and the poor, the capitalist and the wage worker. And that's really how he made his mark. Now, FDR may be associated with the leadership of helping us win World War II, and maybe he's most remembered for that, but you focus on your book on something that happened when he just took office. Um, we were in a depression. Uh, Hoover had not been able to solve the depression. What does it, uh, FDR do in your, in your book that is so uh, a good example of leadership? Well, what happens is the real thing he has to face when he comes into the office is there's a terrible banking crisis that in the weeks before he was inaugurated, banks were collapsing all over the country because people were going to, t they'd heard that banks were collapsing, so they started going to their own banks to try and take their money out. Long lines would be coming, and the banks didn't have enough deposits on hand to give the money back, so it was becoming violent. So once he gets into office, he decides the very first day that he's gonna call what he calls a bank holiday, ironically named, 
close the banks for a week until he can get Congress into session and get Congress to shore up the weaker banks with currency that needed the money, almost like a bailout of the banks. Um, so that they get a law through the Congress that week, they do it, they know which banks are strong, which ones aren't, but then he has to persuade the public that what he's done will make it safe to bring their money back again. So he decides to give the first of his fireside chats on the radio, which will become a symbol of his entire presidency. And in patient, all re very simple terms, he explains to people how banks work. He said, you put your money in a bank, they don't put it in a vault. They invest it. They invest it in, in mortgages. They invest it in businesses to keep the economy going. And he says, what's happened in this situation is some of those banks invested their money in the stock market. Stock market fell, so they didn't have the cash on hand. Others were strong enough, but they don't have the assets to do it at the moment. So we're going to help those banks. We're going to figure out which is strong. And I promise you that if you bring your money back to the bank um, the next Monday when the banks are going to open, it's safer than keeping it under your mattress. But they still worried, would they bring it back? That Monday, there's long lines all across the country, and they worry, but they're bringing their money back. They bring satchels in to bring it back in the bank because of his word. They trusted his word. And then those fireside chats become the most important way that he communicates with the people. That first one was followed by 29 more, 35 fireside chats in his 12 years in office. And his voice was so reassuring. People felt he was coming into their living rooms. Saul Bellow has this great um, memory of being in Chicago on a, hot chuck, on a hot summer night. And he's walking down the street, and he looks inside, and everybody's sitting with their radio on. And they're watching the radio and they're listening to his voice, and his voice came out the window, and Bellow said you could still walk down the street and not miss a word of what he said. And then there's a story of a construction worker going home one night, and his partner said, where are you going? He said, well, my president, he's coming into my living room to talk to me. It's only right that I be there to greet him when he comes. <laughs> but what a difference it was in that time when we could trust the word of the president. So, um... President, President Kennedy had a very ambitious legislative program, but many of the things that he wanted didn't get very far. When Lyndon Johnson becomes president, he decides, I'm going to push Kennedy's agenda and do a better job than Kennedy. One thing you write about that he particularly pushed is the civil rights legislation. Why was it so important to him, and how could he, being from a southern state that wasn't really that interested in integration, and his best friends in the Senate were not integrationists, let's say, how did he manage to pull that off? Well, he knew when he first came into office that he had to do something to show that he had grabbed the reins of power, because there was a real vacuum after John Kennedy was filled, and a lot of people had no real understanding who Lyndon Johnson was. So he decided that he would make his first priority passing the Civil Rights Bill, which had been stuck in the Congress. Indeed, none, none of John Kennedy's domestic initiatives had gotten through. Congress was as broken then as it seems now. Surprisingly, I hadn't fully realized that until I went back to look at this. Somebody was writing about that the Republic was not going to live anymore if Congress couldn't figure out how to get something done together. His friends warned him that if you do this, your own election is 11 months away. A Southern filibuster will inevitably materialize. It'll probably paralyze this bill. You won't get any other bill through. Um, you're going to be expending all your power and all the coin of the presidency on this one thing. And he said to that person, well, what's the president? what the hell is the presidency for then? And he said, I'm like a poker player. I'm going to put all my chips on this one thing. I think he believed that if he could get the South to des desegregate, it would be better for the South, even though they might not believe it at the time. He knew that the civil rights movement had reached a stage where something had to be done, or violence, or dis problems would really arise. And he wanted to do it. And so he took that risk. It was one of the great moments of his presidency. And you know, despite the fact that he did so much more in the next 18 months, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, it's extraordinary. NPR, um, PBS, immigration reform, um, and voting rights, and fair housing. Um, the war in Vietnam obviously cut that legacy in two. So when I knew him in those last days at the ranch, um, there was such a sadness as he talked about these early 18 months and how extraordinary it was, because he got Congress to do things. I mean, he, that bill would never have passed in my judgment without him. He understood that he needed the Republicans in order to bring Republican supports to break the Democratic filibuster from the South. 
So he knows that Everett Dirksen, the minority leader, is the guy he gets to, has to get. So he has drinks with him every night. He's telling me, what do you want in Illinois? These are the days when earmarks were fine. You know, you want a postmastership, you want an ambassadorship, you want a project, and anything you want, Everett, anything. I'm going to give you all the credit. I'm going to give the Republicans the credit. And then finally, he knows that Everett Dirksen wants to be remembered, too. So he said, you know, Everett, if you come with me on this bill, and you bring your Republicans to break the filibuster, and we get this bill passed, 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> How could Dirksen resist? So um, let's suppose you um, say, I, I, I admire your books, but I don't have time to read this book. Can you give me the essence of leadership? <laughs> What would you say these four individuals had in common, and what can other leaders of our country learn from these four people? I, I did feel that I, after exploring this, that there were certain family resemblances. There's no master key to leadership, and they're all very different in their style of leadership, but they do share certain qualities. I mean, they shared, eventually, an empathy toward other kinds of people so that they could bring them together and unite the country rather than dividing the country. They had a humility that allowed them to acknowledge their errors and to learn from their mistakes. Um, they had an ability to communicate to the public in their own technology at the time. I mean, Lincoln, as I said, because he was such a good writer, his speeches would be written in full, and people would read them aloud in, in their places. Teddy Roosevelt had the perfect language, that punchy language with his phrases, speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, he even gave Maxwell House the slogan, good to the very last drop. He was perfect for the new newspaper age at the turn of the 20th century. FDR had the perfect voice for radio. When you think about JFK and Ronald Reagan, they had the perfect ability to talk on television in the time of the three television networks. Um, and then Obama becomes a, a master of the internet world. and then. Mr. Trump masters the, the social media at the time when he was running for campaigns. But there's a problem in that there's a difference in campaigning and governing, which we've discovered that these instant comments can become more troubling. When Lincoln was president, he could, he could have debated with anybody. He was the best debater. He could have spoken extemporaneously whenever he wanted to. When people would go after him, somebody said to him, you're two-faced, he immediately responded, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this face? But, <laughs> but as but as president, but as president, he never spoke extemporaneously. He only wanted to be prepared. He knew something that we need to know today, that words matter, that they have consequences, and he knew that. So, so, um, so, that, so, so that, that was one skill. That was one skill. That was one skill they shared. But the other skill that I think is too often unheralded is they all knew how to relax and replenish their energies, to find time to think, something that we in our 24-7 world think we can never do because we're so busy. Well, they were pretty busy, but they somehow figured it out. Lincoln actually went to the theater more than 100 times during the Civil War. He said when a Shakespeare play came on, he could imagine himself back in the War of the Roses with Prince Hal, and he could forget the war that was raging. He said, people may think my theater going peculiar. If I didn't do it, this terrible anxiety would kill me. So that's, and he also had his sense of humor that allowed him, when things were tough, he would come up with one of his funny stories and he would entertain the cabinet meeting and they'd have to relax for a few moments. When he couldn't sleep at night, he would wake up his two aides, Nicolay and Hay, and he would read them comic passages from Shakespeare. He said, so then he could go to bed at night thinking of those comic passages instead of thinking about the war, which meant that he could survive. Teddy Roosevelt, not surprisingly, given his asthma and his need to build up his body, was able to exercise two hours every afternoon in the White House. And again, we think we don't have time to go to the gym for 30 minutes. And he's doing something pretty important while he's doing this. He would have a boxing match, a wrestling match, or his favorite exercise was to walk in the wooded cliffs of Rock Creek Park, where he had a very simple rule that you had to go point to point. You couldn't go around any obstacle. So if you came to a rock, you had to climb it. If you came to a precipice, you had to go down it. So these companions who are on these ridiculous walks with him are falling by the wayside all along the way. But the best story was told by the ambassador, Jules Jusseron, 
he was from France, and he was so excited for his first walk with the president. He said I, he had his silk outfit on. You know, he thought they'd be on the Champs Elysees. He found himself in the woods. He was dying. He couldn't wait till it was over. They finally come to the big stream, and he thought, "Thank God, we're going home." So he said, "Judge of my horror, as I saw the president unbutton his clothes and say, well, it's an obstacle. We can't go around it. So we we don't want to get our clothes wet. So we might as well take our clothes off." So he said, "So I too, for the honor of France, took off my clothes." <laughs> However. However, I left on my lavender kid gloves. Why? It would be most embarrassing if we should meet ladies on the other side and I didn't have gloves on. <laughs> so, so, um, so anyway, they all found, now, the most interesting person, though, is FDR. So he had a cocktail party every night during World War II where the rule was that you couldn't talk about the war. You could talk about books you'd read, movies you'd seen, gossip that was going on. And after a while, this cocktail party was so important to him that he wanted the people who would be at the cocktail party to live in the White House to be ready for the cocktail party. So, for example, his foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, came for dinner one night, slept over, never left until the war came to an end. <laughs> Princess Martha from Norway, in exile in America during the war, lives with the family on the weekends. Lorena Hickok, who's a friend of Eleanor's, has a bedroom next to Eleanor. His secretary, Missy Lehand, lives with the family in the White House. And the great Winston Churchill came in weeks at a time, spent in the White House with Roosevelt. So when I was working on the book, I became obsessed with the thought of all these people in their bathrobes at night in the corridor and what amazing conversations they must have had and wishing that when I'd been up on that second floor with Lyndon Johnson when I was 24 years old, I'd thought of asking, where did Churchill sleep? Where was Roosevelt? Where was Eleanor? But of course, I wasn't thinking in those terms then. So I mentioned this on a Diane Reem show here in Washington, and it happened that Hillary Clinton then in the White House was listening. So she promptly called me up at the radio station and invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridor together and figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband, and I went through every room up there and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins slept, the Clintons are sleeping where FDR was, and the room they gave us was Winston Churchill's bedroom. There was no way I could sleep. I was certain he was sitting in the corner. He was drinking his brandy, smoking a cigar. In fact, that bedroom's the scene of my favorite story in World War II, when Churchill came there, Right after Pearl Harbor, he and Roosevelt were set to sign a document that put the Associated Nations against the Axis powers, but no one really liked the word Associated Nations, so that morning he awakened with the whole new idea, calling them United Nations against the Axis powers. So excited he was that he wheeled himself into Churchill's bedroom, our bedroom, to tell him the news, but it so happened that Churchill was just coming out of the bathtub and had absolutely nothing on. So Roosevelt said, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. But Churchill, amazingly, still dripping from the tub, has the presence of mind to say, oh no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. Now so, that's a guy you can love. Now, um, you mentioned your husband, and uh, unfortunately your husband passed away recently. In his honor, you're working on another book. You might describe that book. Yes, indeed. My, my husband had cancer this last year of his life. But he had started five years earlier a book that meant a lot to him. It, it was really a, a biography of his mind in a way. Public service was something he valued so much in his life. Despite graduating first in his class at Harvard Law School and clerking for Frankfurter, he really never cared about going in and making money and turning money around from one place to another. He wanted to do something in public. so. He went to do the investigation of the rig television quiz shows. He then was a young speechwriter for JFK, and then with, with LBJ and wrote all of LBJ's great civil rights speeches, that incredible We Shall Overcome speech, the Great Society speech, the Howard University speech, Bobby Kennedy's Ripples of Hope speech, Al Gore's concession speech. But more important than the speeches even is that he devoted his life to public service. And he's watching, he was 86 years old when he died, and he was watching, he said, what was going on right now. And he realized that through his long life, he had seen the turns and the twists in American history. And like me too, he believed, he said, that the end of America has loomed many times before. America is not as fragile as we think. So he wanted to write a book that would show people that politics and public service can be an honorable vocation, wanting to make young people believe once again that they could enter public life and have a fulfilling time 
and he hadn't quite finished the book. He got cancer this last year, but the book kept him going. I mean, it was so incredible to watch that he wanted to live, not just for the book, but because he was happy, and there was nothing I could care about more than knowing that this man who I've known for 45 years, married for 42 years, wanted to go through everything he could. He went through surgery, and they thought they got it, the cancer. He went through radiation for seven weeks. They told him he got it, and we came and had champagne with, with the doctors. And then he came home, and he got in, the, in two months late, two months before he died in May, it came back again. And this time, the only thing they could do was immunotherapy, and he finally got pneumonia and came home to hospice. But it was the most extraordinary thing. I'd, I'd never seen death the way I saw it with him. My parents died when I was young, and they had heart attacks, so it was over in a minute. But he knew, I don't know that he knew he was dying, but he, knew, but he would wake up from his pain medicine and was like an Irish wake. All our friends came in day after day. They'd come in, and he'd wake up and talk to them, and he'd say something to them. And he had this light in his eye. And I must say, the last thing he said to me was, you are a wonder, something I will never forget for as long as I live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doris, for a great uh, story. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.